has been a worrying point for the Chinese credit system, and the PBOC has just removed the lending rate floor as well. How are you viewing this move? Well, I think the key issue here is the broader outlook for, for China and positioning and contextualizing the recent moves by the PBOC in the bigger, in the bigger picture. And our view here is a couple of, uh, a couple of things. Uh, number one, that the tightening of interbank rates, which we saw in June, was a deliberate one. There was an overshoot for various technical reasons that we don't have time to go into. But the key point is that it does appear that the PBOC did intend to, uh, to tighten liquidity. And that was in direct response to wanting to curtail some of the significant increase in lending in the shadow banking market. Now, shadow banking itself is something which has been allowed to develop and, in fact, in some cases encouraged as part of a gradual deregulation process and a development of non-banking financing channels. And the recent move by the PBOC in terms of reducing some limits on the floor of lending rates is an incremental step in that move towards deregulate overall uh, interest rates. So the bigger picture here is that China is in the process of, uh, of moving towards a freer uh, and, and less regulated uh, financial structure while at the same time trying to uh, preserve uh, banking profitability and all that in the context, of course, of having a broader and more integrated set of reforms which span not just the, the financial markets themselves but also the real economy. Uh, that overall process of reform is something that, in our view, is important, necessary, and is something that will take some time to occur. And against that backdrop, we're thinking that the price of that, so to speak, is going to be somewhat lower economic growth. So the bigger message here is one of a trade-off be between the speed of growth and the progression of reforms. And that's one of the reasons why we have a somewhat more conservative view in terms of our fundamental outlook for China than has been the case, say, um, one or two years ago. Concerns over QE exit sparked the sell-off across Asian assets. How are you advising investors to approach the eventual tapering? There, of course, has been a significant amount of discussion and, and market movement around the whole topic of tapering that the Fed has, uh, has clearly signaled. And our view on this is that the bigger picture is that tapering will occur. You can argue about the timing and the magnitude of it, but it's quite clear that the so-called liquidity tide has shifted here. Now, contextualizing that, markets were quite concerned about an overly immediate and strict implementation of Fed tapering, and that's why we saw a very significant sell-off in June. We've now seen a recovery in markets as there's been a bit of a so-called sigh of relief, as there have been very clear indications from Fed, various Fed governors that the pace of tapering would be more moderate than the market was uh, initially uh, expecting. So there's been a bit of, of, of up and down in terms of the way markets have traded as a consequence of that. But the bigger picture to emphasize here is that tapering will occur, and it's appropriate that it does if indeed the U.S. economy does pick up speed, as we think uh, is the case. And so our expectation is that tapering will begin likely in September and, and continue gradually through into the middle of next year. We don't think we get the first actual increase in Fed funds rate, the policy rate, until early 2016. But the actual timing of all this and the magnitude will, of course, be contingent upon the, uh, the actual data which comes out, which the Fed has cl clearly signaled they will be looking at in order to calibrate their response.